I think the market, to your point on pricing in this pause and pivot and this huge overlap of bullishness that people take away from that is a big mistake. And I'm not ready. And Frank, I don't know where you stand on this, but I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon of inflation has peaked. Of course, inflation has peaked from present yesterday's data to the last couple of months. However, you just touched on it in a great point on the rental incomes. Over 50% of the consumer price index, the CPI, is rent, food, and energy. Mm -hmm. Well, energy has dropped. I think it was down 1.6 or 1.8%, which is fantastic. Gas Gas prices are lower. Hey, I'm going to fill up later for around 309 here. I just saw it coming to work this morning earlier. That's Florida, yeah. And you know how you get people feeling good about paying 309? You make them pay four to five dollars for a while. That's how you do it. (laughs) You don't look at what they were paying. (laughs) So kudos to that. Paying like, yeah, a couple months. (laughs) However, We've seen this drop in consumer price in uh, index, which is great. But what has oil done? You, you mentioned uh, a little bit of food back and forth. That that that's going to continue to fluctuate and at least remain high. Rentals. I just don't understand how, unless you're sh- signing extremely short term leases, I don't know how that's going to come down significantly anytime soon. Unless you, I mean, I guess people's rents year over year starting in January are going to start coming in. I don't That's know how saying, those like, are going to be very down. down. When Jeremy Siegel said he says rentals are down, I'm like, let me tell you something. Anybody, you can go anywhere. You tell me that someone that's paying less signing a rental today than they were a year ago in any area. I'll challenge you on that. You're not going to see it. So you yeah. can't tell me that, that, oh, rental prices are good now. When they're, coming, they're not down year over year. They're still up a, a, a ton. Uh are they going to come down? Yeah, they're going to come down. It's going to take longer than expected. But the point is, you know, in the next, are they going to come down in the next three months? Because we're only expected two more, you know, 25 basis point hikes, which is priced into the market. And then we finish at like 4.7, 4.8 around there. Uh, but, you know, is that price into the markets right now? Uh, you know, more of a rate hike. But how do you stop after three months, especially with rental incomes or not? You're not going to see it drop that much in three months. You're going to see the housing market. It is starting to deteriorate. Even in Florida, you're seeing it starting to deteriorate. Uh, and it's not seasonal right now either. So it's going to make it more difficult to sell houses and stuff, even though mortgage rates have went from what? 7.2, 7.3. I think they're po- like 6.3 now, 6.4. But that'll be bullish as well. I mean, non-seasonal, if they go down a little bit more because you have lower volume than normal over mm-hmm. unseasonable times, that's yeah. all going to be bullish for that. Yeah. But in, I, I think the mistake people are making, and of course, everybody knows that listens to this, that I'm bullish on energy and energy prices. Energy is pulled back significantly. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, in order to have this camp or this mindset of, hey, inflation is going in the right direction, we've peaked, now it's just a matter of how fast does it drop and then when does it steady out? I think you're relying on the fact that energy is going to remain low. And I just don't see how that's happening when you throw in all the crazy variables. And let me point out- Variables, and let me, but even the strategic oil reserve. I mean, Biden actually said, this is, we're going to wait for it to come down to this price to just buy it and fill it back up again, which is down significantly. So they're going to be there at active buy in the market. And so the take- It will be interesting. And to couple with that, you can't release forever. I mean, you can do it for a long time. You can draw down reserves to very low levels. People like to cite things like, oh, they're, it's the lowest since 1984. Okay, that's fine. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. I'm simply saying it can't go on forever. Mm-hmm. China can't stay locked down forever. They can stay locked down longer than people believe, mm-hmm. but they can't stay locked down forever. And my point to this, the cliff note version of this is who drives the price of oil and oil supply? It's the same entity. And the answer is OPEC. We have given up because of policies the right or the the front runner in global energy for right now. We could get it back, but until we make changes at the policy level, we're not going to. We have given over that power to OPEC, who, if you don't think, is going to just wait and see, take the longer approach on the Russian sanctions that previously went into effect, what we do with the strategic petroleum reserve over here in the U.S., they're going to be able to hold monthly meetings and or emergency meetings anywhere, anytime. And all they have to do is hint at cutting production and pulling those strings to keep Brent world oil closer to a hundred dollars a barrel. They failed at that, which is why they've made big announcements and reversals over the last couple months. And they're not doing anything in the n- near term as we unfold through this recent, the Russian sanctions have only been in effect a little over a week. I'm talking about the latest ones on the price cap of Russian oil. Going into next February, we've talked about more sanctions. I just think the the short cliff here, the, the short story here is you have to 
you have to be at the mercy of lower oil prices in order for these CPI and inflation data in the future to remain positive. And I would, gl- and I'm happy to take against or bet against that. Yeah. And it was interesting in OPEC, just a little background here. It's funny because what they did in 2013, 14 is they started releasing a ton of oil, right? Because they knew that we were becoming dominant and we had the technology. So we also couldn't produce it because again, this is like 2009, 10, when even, you know, Shinier Energy w- was looking to be, we were supposed to be, an, that was supposed to be a, a, an import facility. Right of LNG, and then they were like, "Wait a minute, holy shit, we got all this, like, we got to turn this around really quick." And it took you know years to, to to change it with all the trains and stuff like that. It's, it's an amazing story that I followed for a long time. But OPEC was just releasing so much oil because they said, "Listen, we have to get this thing below you know seventy, sixty. That's how much it used to cost." And in, in reality, it, it made us improve our technology even more, right. lower our costs even more because they did were able to push it down significantly. I think it's in two thousand fifteen, sixteen. Uh, you know, went below four dollars a barrel, even thirty in the thirties. Yeah. Where a lot of these guys couldn't do for forty five, fifty. Again, I was covering the industry fifty five. You know, someone would say, "Well, we have a well, we could do it twenty five dollars, but it's one well in in one you know area in specific county within the Permian, maybe in Glasscock or something like that." But uh, and then you just couldn't keep them down that long, right? So now, as, as they went higher above sixty, not only that, we lower our cost significantly. We found out how to do this at, yep. at a much cheaper cost and improve our technology. So it, it's just a matter of saying, "Hey, okay, you guys could drill, and and we have an unlimited supply." <laughs> Yeah, you know, people say that's crazy. Unlimited. You don't have a limited supply. You're limited. Let me tell you something. It's unlimited because as prices go higher, uh, learn about the Permian Basin, learn about the Sprayberry, learn about things like that because you, these are massive deposits that you drill deeper and deeper and it costs more. But if you're at 100, 120, you drill deeper and deeper. You're going to be drilling the ocean as well. But I mean, now you're bringing so many more share plays into play uh, when, when the price is much higher because right. now you can afford to drill. 15,000 feet, 20,000 feet. It's not just 7,000 or 5,000 or whatever. I mean, the, the Eagle Ford has a pay dirt of, of 300 feet. That's where it is. You got to go, you drill down and then horizontally in there and in that three, and then boom, you're fracking. That's where the oil is. But there's like three, there's like seven of those in the Permian that go deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and just bring up like, a, you know, just go to Google and take a look at it and you'll see it. You can see they do a great job in pictures, but. Yeah, you know, it's, it's amazing the things we do in reality that seem like movies. Like, what are we going to do? Yeah. Well, we're going to drill down a mile here and then hang a left and drill yeah. a little bit longer and grab it. Oh, no big deal. All right. And, and the technology is amazing. To, to nerd out on you, that's just a great story of capitalism and innovation. Yeah. And, and, and you know, then, you know, you had the complaints that they were using different chemicals, which they were, and now they clean that up as well. No, no, but they clean no, it up as well and stuff. And, and you know, again, it, it's amazing that we have this kind of technology and, and you know, why are we not? Using a lot. So, am I crazy to think that we haven't seen the peak in inflation? Do you think oil will remain low enough with global demand and such that we have peaked, or am I crazy I, to think I, it's going to go back up? Peak in inflation, I mean, right. because these rate cuts, and I, I mean, say the last two rate cuts of some hikes. basis points, uh, hikes. I mean, have not even been factored in. They haven't been. They're not in the markets right now. You know, you, you think they are, but they're not. And and I try to explain this to people where you know, say you. After COVID, you have this big pool of money of twenty, thirty thousand, or whatever it is, big pool of money that you built up because you're getting, you know, checks. Business is good. They push forward demand and everything, and now you're raising rates and your bills are getting much higher. So that thirty thousand goes to, you know, twenty five. It goes to twenty. It goes to fifteen. Then you're like, holy shit! Yeah, and this happens over three to six months, and then you're like, wait, I really have to cut back. Okay, where else am I going to get money from? Uh, let me see if I can get out of my house. My credit card payment's nineteen percent. Let me take out HELOCs, which all the banks are sending out to all the customers right now. HELOC loans, right? We knew what happened in 2008 when that happened, right? These variable rate loans taking out, you know, home equity line of credit and you're doing it for whatever, 8%, 9%, but you could pay off your credit card for 19%, but at the end of the day, you're still paying 8% yeah. on equity in your home and you're taking that equity out of your house. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just, for me, when I see where, where rates are that we're going higher, I, I think we peak. We, I'm hoping that we peak. I really do hope that we peak uh, and, and we, we need to come down here. But in, in order to come down, you have to destroy demand. And you have to significantly have the unemployment rate go much, much higher from here. And that's not a good scenario. But that's the bullish case that everyone's looking at. Like, that's the bullish case. We have to see, like, CPI come down. We have to see demand fall off a cliff. They think there's going to be, like, this mild slowdown and just, you know, unemployment go up a little bit. Like, we're in ch- ch- territories. Don't throw out all your, your books on, on investing. We've never seen this shit in our lives, what's going on right now. I mean, it's crazy. And to, to say that, oh, it's going to be a perfect scenario, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind if you think next year that they are going to be like, okay, inflation came down, the market stays steady, and now we're going to lower rates maybe in, in Q3 next year, and everything's going to be fine, and get back to You're out of your mind if you think that's going to happen. <laughs> you're out of your mind because there's a million factors involved, even with housing. You're seeing the cracks in housing. You're seeing the cracks in, in all the real estate that these private equity firms raised, right? All these private REITs. That that said that they were up nine percent while the publicly traded ones are down with the same you know areas and properties and stuff like that. We covered this are down you know thirty percent this year. 
Uh, so a lot of the, you're getting redemptions from family offices like crazy, uh, you know, across the board of 1100 REITs is 800 private, private REITs. And you have to think like the two largest. Well, think redemptions. of the headaches going on in that world. They limit their redemptions, right? But still it, it's, it's going to mean that you're going to have to sell these properties and sell them at lower price. There's a lot of things going on underneath the hood that, that are really scary right now. And I think they're all going to come to fruition you know, into next year because of these high rates. We'll see what happens.